These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. We continue this episode with our look into Mesopotamian industries. And if you remember from last episode, we're doing things in sort of a narrative fashion. And judging from the people I heard from, it's going pretty well. Instead of just dropping hard facts on you, what we're doing is taking the raw research and using it to sketch out a picture of what sort of generically what ancient Mesopotamian life would have looked like as it relates to the production of various things. Now, this is inherently hazardous, because not only am I entering the world of fiction here a bit, but also compressing over a thousand years of history and an entire region into the experience of one imaginary person. Obviously, there is no generic average person like I'm describing. Each actual historical person would have lived a specific non-generic life, but we don't have a detailed biography of average people who lived in the Mesopotamian Bronze Age. So we're settling for this creative exercise to sort of fill in the gaps and smooth off the edges a bit. Our story today begins with Ea Rabi, whose name means the god Ea is great. He's been married for three years to his wife, whose name Ilsha Higalu means the abundance of her god. Their first son, Ea Bani, whose name means Ea created me, is a bit over two years old, and they've just recently lost their second son two days after the birth. Actually, Ea Rabi is a bit worried that the gods might be upset with him, because shortly after the mourning ritual for his lost infant ended, Ea Rabi's father became ill, and ten days later passed away. Ea Rabi's first priority was to assist his five brothers with the funeral arrangements, but today he has four jars of beer tied to the family mule, and he's headed to the diviner who lives the next town over. Going to the temple would be more reliable, but also more expensive, even if the fees of the local diviner are themselves a bit of a strain on his wealth. When he arrives, he hands the jars off to the diviner's son, who does the hard work of carrying them around to the back of the house when Ea Rabi enters. The diviner can see from Ea Rabi's face that this is not a social call, and invokes the blessing of both the diviner's family god and the god Ea, to whom Ea Rabi is dedicated. He explains the recent deaths in his family, and explains that he's felt a hostile spirit within his household, particularly from his brothers, and he's been feeling fatigue after working in the sun all day, and his bones are not recovering with the speed that they did when he was younger. It goes unstated, though clearly understood, that he's worried that he's offended a god in some way. Once the talking is done, the diviner looks to his son to ensure that the payment was received, then takes A. Rabi into a very small room deeper in the house, a room with barely enough space for both the men to kneel before a mud-brick altar. The diviner invokes the many gods. The high Anunnaki are each named and praised, then the national god of the nearby city, then Era, A. Rabi's family god, and then Ea, his personal deity. The diviner's son knows the timing and pattern of the prayers, and right at the end he arrives with a small, wide water dish and a tiny clay jar. The diviner lifts the small jar and alternates between prayers in the normal Akkadian language and words spoken in what Ea Rabi believes to be the language of the gods. First, it's Ea Rabi's personal god who's invoked, and a small drop of oil is dripped into the middle of the water dish. The oil droplet floats upon the water and does not move much, and the diviner reveals that Ea Rabi's personal god is content with him. This comes as a great relief, quelling the most serious doubt in Ea Rabi's heart. But if Ea is not upset with him, which god has he offended? They've moved next to the god of a nearby city, but this god is also untroubled. Third, they've tried the family god. Though Ea Rabi is personally devoted to Ea, his father had been devoted to Era, the powerful god of seven troubles. Era 
was never the easiest god to be devoted to. Much of his power lay in curses, not in blessings. But his father and three of his brothers had always prospered with the family god. Ea Rabi, however, soon finds out that the family god is irritated with him. Having identified the angry god, the diviner offers prayer and praise, ritually agitating the water and observing the actions of the oil within. A few tense and thoughtful minutes later, the diviner reveals that Ea Rabi's issue is with his family, and with the passing of his father, he should sell his share of the inheritance, separate from his brothers, and purchase land on a virgin field. Ea Rabi rather expected that this is what the gods desired, but one should never make a big life decision on one's own initiative, but rather wait and accept the commands of the gods. When Arabi was on his way home, plan already decided in his mind, he stopped by the house of the scribe in his own village and arranged for the scribe to come visit Arabi's family home later that evening. He then arrived at home and announced to his brothers his intention to sell his portion of the inheritance. An afternoon of haggling later, and two of his elder brothers had promised payment in a variety of forms in exchange for the po their portion of the field, livestock, and the room in the family house that had been left to Ea Rabi in their father's will. Part of the payment would be denominated in grain and wool from the family stores, but the majority of it would be the two elder brothers taking on the loan for Ea Rabi to purchase land up to a certain value. No one in the household had enough liquid wealth to be making large land pur purchases, but their combined incomes were enough to stand surety for a loan on Ea Rabi's behalf. The scribe arrived after dinner time and recorded the transaction on three small clay receipt tablets, giving one of each to the three brothers party to the agreement. A few days later, fresh land deed in hand, Arabi then packed up his things, borrowed the family donkey, and set out towards a brand new field three villages away from the house in which he grew up. The local king had, just the previous year, conducted a large canal expansion project, and a number of plots had been offered for sale on either side of the new man-made waterway. A mix of connections, bribes, and proper payments had been necessary to secure the land, and a representative of the king was living nearby to oversee the distribution of the lands. The best plots at the headwaters of the canal went to those who worked for the royal household, but there were plenty further down the canal that were put up for sale to help offset the costs of construction. As a royal slave leads the family to the plot, it's hot. The land is six iku in size, which should produce just enough for his family of three, plus a good bit of surplus. It is rectangular along the canal, 20 ninden in length running along the water and 30 ninden running away from the water, about 120 meters by 180, a bit over 2 hectares in total. It's still early summer, far too early to plant, but Arabi has a lot of work to do before the first seed goes in the soil. The family will live in a tent directly on the field for a while. Once the first harvest brings in some money, they're going to look to purchase a small house in a nearby village, but for now a tent will do, and if there's time, Ea Rabi is thinking to maybe make a house out of mud. Not a mud brick house like we saw built last episode, but each day he'll mix dirt and water and plop it down in a line forming a small rectangle, maybe five by three meters. That unformed line of mud will just be piled by hand, as high as it can go without sliding over, then left in the sun to dry. Then the next day, another layer will be added on top of that, and in perhaps three weeks, the walls will be high enough to put a temporary roof on top, perhaps some woven reeds, or perhaps even the cloth that they're using for their tent. It's a poor man's house, but there's no sense in making anything more than a temporary dwelling out in the farms. 
there are far too many wild animals, bandits, and other sorts of trouble for an isolated farmstead to be a good idea in the Mesopotamian Bronze Age. Everyone's house is in the nearby village, and they all walk to work each day, the commute being safer than an isolated but more convenient dwelling place. But house or not, Arabi's top priority in life was to get this hard scrabble dirt, this patch marked by four stones adjacent to the small man-made branch of a canal, transformed into something which could feed his family in the coming year and hopefully even provide a surplus. The first step is to flatten the land. The plot is already quite flat, but no natural land is perfectly level, and besides, he wants the level of the land just slightly below that of the water running beside it. And so, he goes out under the hot Mesopotamian sun with his copper hoe and scrapes at the ground, dragging the high points down, pulling out the stones, filling in potholes, and smoothing the land in general. Not only the gods could make the, that part of the earth perfectly flat, but after a great deal of effort, he's done a pretty good job of leveling his new field. It takes a standard worker about four days to prepare one iku of land, and with six iku to manage, it takes him all month in the heat. But as a bonus, all four sides of his field now have a small, even berm of dirt. This berm, which barely rises to the height of his knee, provides a visual marker of his land boundaries, but more importantly, they'll play a crucial role in irrigation. Also, A or B has a nice-sized pile of rocks in one corner of the field, which the family can use in all manner of sundry tasks. This task is harder than it should be in a normal year, since he has to prepare the land so early, in the high heat of the summer. His neighbors in nearby fields are, like him, putting in the work to make a virgin land farmable, and many of them complain about the extremity of the work. A. Rabi, though, has no one to complain to. His wife will not put up with that sort of talk from him, and Shirking will only take food directly out of his own mouth. Now that the field is flattened, he scrapes his hoe over the entire field once again to flatten it a bit more. Some farmers even sweep the field at the peak of the summer with a broom made of straw though Ea Rabi considers this to be mere tradition, not a thing required by the gods, and skips this step. There are still weeds in the field, and in places there are thicker patches where he cuts back, but he knows it's not good to remove all the weeds from the fields, though he's unaware of the role that the plants play in nitrogen fixation, desalinization, and in providing shade to the first sprouts of a new seedling. Now it's late summer, and Arabi is nervous. Though his field is in good shape, he's about to conduct a preparatory irrigation, and he knows that if he hasn't built up the berms on his perimeter correctly, or if he over-irrigates, there's a chance that the water from his field could break through his berms and flood his neighbor's field. That could lead to a lawsuit and the amount of grain that A. Arabi has set aside for costs associated with establishing his field would be completely wiped out if he needed to pay a fine in court. And so carefully, carefully, he digs away at the berm separating the newly built canal from his land. The water level is low right now, so he has to dig nearly a forearm's length down before the water starts to pour from the canal to the field. Even when low, the water level in the canal is now higher than in his field, which is why he spent so much time with his hoe lowering and flattening the land. Watching for nearly an hour, the water he's allowed into his field has filled up to the height of a few fingers. With great urgency, he takes the dirt that he'd set aside beforehand and closes the hole he's just dug, making sure to pack the dirt tightly to prevent leakage. In more established fields, they have wooden gates that the farmer need only open up to allow the water in, and in northern lands they have water wheels and water cranes that can even lift water from below the level of a field, 
But for a poor farmer like Ea Rabi, he makes do with what he has. His two-year-old son enjoys running clumsily through the flooded field under the close eye of his mother, Ilsha Higalu. With no sign of his own berms being overtopped or breaking down, Ea Rabi breathes a sigh of relief, gives an offering of grain and beer in thanks to the gods, and spends the rest of the day in much-needed rest. The next day, the water has mostly receded, much of it evaporated, and the rest was absorbed into the ground. Some farmers would use an ox to break up the field, but Arabi cannot afford the expense at this point. He takes his trusty copper hoe and his copper field axe, and he chops at the ground, loosening the soil as deeply as he can manage. He works fast, harder than even when he's been flattening the field, because he knows that the longer it takes, the drier the ground will get, and he's got only a few days before any memory of the flood in his field will have been forgotten completely by the dirt. Following the breaking of the soil, there's another two weeks of flattening with his hoe. As he comes across larger lumps and clods, he makes sure they're broken up before flattening the ground again. This process takes him another month to get his six acres ready for the first plowing. He's actually a bit ahead of the game at this point. As Arabi looks around, he sees that many of the neighboring fields are worked by laborers and renters, and are responsible to a landlord for their output. Arabi knows that he's fortunate that his father will, father's will left him enough to be a self-sufficient farmer, and that motivation boost has made him a bit more productive than those around him. The practical upshot of this is that he expects the price of plow teams are going to be very high later in the plowing season, as the less motivated scramble to get their tasks finished before the onset of winter. Thus, he resolves to hire a plowing team sooner rather than later, even though putting down seed early leaves him vulnerable should the summer heat linger and damage the young seedlings. Every night, he watches the stars and asks the gods for heavenly signs giving him permission to begin the seeding. And a few days before the star signs were expected, he receives a dream vision from Ea, his personal god, telling him that it will be safe to plant early this year. The very next day, he hires a plow team, three oxen, one plow, and one man to drive the oxen. The plow is a wooden structure, probably older than Ea Rabi or even the man who owns it. There are marks of frequent repair, but at the bottom is a triangular copper blade, a hand width at the base and two palms in length. The metal body is clearly very old, but the business end gleams orange from fresh sharpening. It'll be the plowman's job to guide the ox, while Arabi takes the less skilled but more physically demanding job of guiding the plow. This involves taking the two handles of the plow and keeping it in line while helping to push it down. This takes the power of oxen and men working together to dig through the hard Mesopotamian topsoil, even in late fall when the ground gets a bit cooler and wetter and softer. The two men and three animals make diagonal lines, each line a bit more than one cubit from the last, fitting about nine rows into about six meters. On Arabi's six iku plot, the first plowing takes two to three days, much quicker than when he was working by hand. But the oxen aren't done yet. It may be early in the season, but the plow does not rest for the entire plowing season, and the plowman that Arabi has hired shows up the next morning with a second plow, one of somewhat different design. This one has a blade which digs not quite as deeply, only two to three fingers down into the dirt, and includes a small wooden funnel at the end. If Arabi's son was old enough, the boy would man the funnel but for the next few years he'll need to rely on his brothers or on hired help. This year, his brother Era Nada, whose name means Praise the God Era, has come over in exchange for Arabi's promise to come over and help a few weeks from now. 
this round of plowing is much like the first, except instead of going in diagonal lines, they're making straight lines across the field. And, most importantly, this time they're finally seeding the land with Arenata standing over the funnel with a constant drip feed of barley seeds from a cloth pouch, each seed falling two fingers deep into the earth. As they cross his field back and forth, Arabi sometimes looks back at those tiny seeds with hope, offering a prayer of thanks to the gods, thinking about what will sprout up. Arabi loves barley in a way that many others around him don't, for most people, the fact that it doesn't taste as good as emmer wheat or so-called bread wheat, the other two main cereals, means they never have more than a grudging respect for barley. But Arabi was taught by his father to respect the virtues of barley. Wheat plants are fussy, growing best in fields that have never been used. Arabi recognizes that frequently used and heavily irrigated fields weaken the soil, despite not understanding the mechanisms of salinization and nutrient depletion, and considers the fact that barley can live in weaker soil proof that it's a stronger grain. And surely, a strong man would want to eat a strong grain. Nutritionally, his father always believed that the other grains provided less food per grain, causing weakness in those that ate the same quantity, or a taste for gluttony in those who ate more. And not only does wheat provide less strength for the body than barley, it's also usually sprouted more yield at harvest time. It's for those reasons that for every wheat field, there are six or seven or eight fields of barley. Among Aorabi's immediate neighbors, that proportion was a bit more skewed towards wheat, but that's only because they could afford it in that virgin soil. For his part, there was a religious significance to barley. Wheat would not be ready to harvest until the early summer, when it was already hot and well after the year had started. In his mind, it was a grain for the lazy, and the heat of the summer was their punishment. Barley, however, was ready to harvest right at the new year, the spring equinox, and the very first thing he expected to do after the week-long New Year's festivities was to bring in the harvest for his family. Clearly, it was a grain operating on the timetable of the high gods, the Anunnaki, and any pious man should prefer the grain of the gods over the grain of the lazy, even if everyone knew that wheat tasted better. Anyway, a few days later, the oxen are sent off to the next field, and Arabi has to pay up. The cost of the ox team is about 15 liters of barley per iku, about 15 liters of barley were put into the ground for seed in each iku as well. That comes out to 180 liters of barley total. Arabi has never been formally trained in math, but this sort of economic calculation is a matter of life and death, and he has known how to think about a few specific numerical problems since he was a child even if they'd never been formally taught anything past counting in an abstract sense. And his mathematical intuition, plus the empty grain sacks in his family tent, tell him that they're in trouble. It is six months until the seeds he just planted will be ready to harvest. A grown man needs two liters of grain per day for healthy eating. His wife is pregnant, and his son has recently gone off milk. Realistically, they need 360 silla, or approximately 360 liters, of grain to make it. But looking at his jars after paying the ox driver, there's less than 300 silla in the house. If he was more established, he could consider taking a loan. But not only is it likely anyone will loan him anything, the family has big plans to use the surplus from the harvest to make themselves secure and a loan would take away from their ability to do that in the coming year, eating from their future prosperity by taking a loan today. And so Arabi decides that he will reduce his food to three quarters of a liter each day until the harvest approaches. This is a starvation ration, 
but he knows that it'll be survivable for a winter. After all, he's seen plenty of neighbors doing the same thing. His wife, Ilsha Higalu, protests that the two of them should share the burden, and the two argue over it for a few minutes. Eventually, Arabi hits his wife, shouts angrily, and she falls silent. Arabi is a tolerant and fair-minded man who loves his wife deeply. He's glad she does not make him hit her regularly, because even though his culture has taught him that domestic violence is necessary to maintain an orderly and happy household, he's very proud to have a naturally obedient wife who usually doesn't need such correction. He remembers the proverb, a malicious wife living in a house is the worst of all afflictions. And he believes that such a wife can be generated both from too much hitting and from not enough hitting. With domestic violence having settled the matter, things soon calm down around the household. Arabi needs to take the days immediately following the planting to work over the entire field once again with the hoe, covering the seeds and chasing away the birds. He's diligent, aware of a need to move to the next step soon, but not in a particular hurry either. He feels the bite of the short rations, and each time his stomach rumbles, he takes it as a cue to offer a prayer to the great gods of heaven, cycling through praises of each one of them throughout the day. He thanks them for the blessings he does have, and when it gets hard, he asks them to bless the seedlings beneath his feet. He knows it isn't as effective as a proper temple service, and some say maybe the gods can't hear him out in the field, but he also believes that this small, personal, divine communication is important for his own piety and pleases the gods in a small way. As soon as he gets the field in good shape, with the seeds buried a small but consistent depth beneath the earth and the ground brought nearly back to level, he again digs open the berm of the canal adjacent to his field. This time, though, he doesn't just let it sit and form a pool on his land. He needs the initial water to activate the seeds, or, as Ea Rabi understands it, he needs the generative power of the god Ea, in the form of his life-giving water, to impregnate the seeds so that the miracle of life may occur. But, if the water is left to sit too long, it may drown the seedlings as they burst forth. And so he's coordinated this day with his neighbor and his neighbor's neighbor, and another hole is being dug in the berm separating these various fields from each other. These irrigation chains can actually go on for a good number of fields, giving life to many seeds in a single day before the water is allowed to flow freely either back into the canal somewhere downstream or in this case into some open pasture land. Knowing that he has a spillway already set up, Arabi is much freer with the water than he was previously. There's very little risk of flooding a field that isn't expecting water when there's already somewhere for the water to go. And for most of the afternoon, he watches his field, field fill up and the water pass on to the next field. Standing atop the canal berm, he can distantly see the pasture where the water is ending up and laughs at the distant sheep as they appear to panic at the small amount of oncoming water. As Shamash, the mighty divine sun, approaches the earth for the evening, Arabi's neighbor waves, signaling that the neighbor downstream all got enough water, and Arabi waves back in acknowledgement before closing the gap back up. After the canal has been secured, and there's little chance of a nighttime flooding incident, he returns to his tent and is able to relax for the first time since arriving at this new plot of land five months earlier. Once the first seedlings sprout up, he'll need to repeat the irrigation procedure, then again when they grow to about knee-high, and then a final time, very lightly, once the heads of the grain start to form. Until then, though, he'll be kept busy with numerous things. In a normal year, both he and his wife would spend much of this time in domestic industry, his wife making cloth, both of them potentially making beer, but there's no surplus for materials to do this sort of thing. What he can do, though, is start making a mud house, 
one layer at a time, letting each layer dry for a day before putting a new layer in sequence. This isn't as nice as a mud brick house, but it is something he can do for his family before harvest time, giving them a semi-permanent residence in a small corner of the field. But the most important concerns for the winter are the gods and the king. As his field grows, it needs to be protected from all manner of calamities. First up is mice. Later he'll need magical and divine protection from other pests, from bad weather, from weak harvests, from bandits, witchcraft, and ghosts. He cannot afford the services of a priest or a diviner until the harvest comes, so he and his wife spent a good deal of time crafting from mud and clay small dolls to place on the altar. Some of these dolls represent the gods, though they're not blessed to be full cult idols in which the god actually resides. Others of the dolls represent various sacrifice and ritual objects, animals and the family themselves mostly, and rituals with which a wealthy man would do with the sacrifice of live animals and elaborate multi-day incantations can be done by the poor in their own households with clay proxies. None of this is as difficult as the hard work of field preparation and planting, but it does keep the day busy. The other thing that will keep the day busy is the three weeks that Ea Rabi is called to serve the king this year. Corvi labor requirements vary greatly from year to year and place to place, often taking household circumstances into account. But all that added up, this year he's going to owe three weeks of labor to the king. Unusually, Arabi is looking forward to it, for during those weeks the royal treasury will feed him instead of the rapidly dwindling stockpile at home. A royal messenger informs his village that the Corps of V labor will be expanding the new canal, and for three weeks he lives in a tent with forty sweaty men from around the region, as they all dig in the dirt each day to make new land for the king to expand his arable land increasing the prosperity of the region as a whole, and ultimately allowing the king to maintain a larger number of troops. None of that has much to do with A or B, though if there is a war, there's a good chance he may get called up for it. For now, though, he's just happy that he gets to eat a full ration for three weeks. The restful winter passed fast, and A or B spent much of it hungry, praying to the gods for the strength to continue onwards. In the tenth month, what future folks would call January, Ilsha Hagalu gave birth. The parents rejoiced to see their new child, but an awareness of the food shortage and the child's female gender both dampened the excitement for a bit. Still, it was a happy interlude, after which the mounting hunger and weakness A. Rabi was feeling on his short rations worsened his temper greatly. His wife reminded him regularly that they needed to start making preparations for the coming harvest. He needed to construct a sickle, either out of bits of hand-sharpened flint pasted together with bitumen, or by baking clay into a, press into a crescent and honing the inner edge. Bronze and copper sickles both existed, of course, but the tool's durability was matched by its greater cost. Adding to the costs, Harvesting is a three-man job, and with their son now three years old, it'll be a long time before he could take on even the easiest work assignments. But the situation in the household got more and more tense as Arab B's mood worsened and his body weakened, and one day Ilsha Hagalu took her two children and simply left without a word. Arab B raged inside his house for a full day and much of the night, gorging himself on barley porridge and snapping the wooden handle of his hoe. The moon had been out for a long time before he finally fell asleep in the field, and even the bright Mesopotamian sun did not wake him until it was directly overhead. Upon awakening the next day, he saw that his wife had returned, and she calmly explained that, he had re that she had returned to the house of his brothers and asked them for help with the harvest and for a flint sickle. Deeply embarrassed, Arabi said nothing, 
as she explained that he would need to return to his brother's plot afterwards and assist each of them in turn with their harvests. He then spent the rest of the day in the fields, picking at weeds with little effect. At the end of the month, the family was out of food. A or B stopped eating completely, and his wife and son ate only part of a scoop each. The new year was a day of much anticipation, but little celebration, and they spent only the minimum requisite three days of prayer to the gods, with nothing to offer but clay proxies for the wealth they prayed desperately for. On the third day, Ilshahagalu's milk stopped from the mother's lack of nutrition, and the new infant cried from a hunger that her parents were unable to satisfy. On the fourth day, still technically in the celebration period, Arabi went out into his field, where six iku of barley heads were full to bursting, and began to cut, collect, and stack them himself. It was slow going, and when two of his brothers showed up the next day, he'd done about one half of an iku for all his effort. That first day, with one man to cut the grain stalks, one man to bundle them up, and one man to collect the bundles into stacks, they were able to cover twice that much ground. The next day, his brothers brought bread. The family had never been close, but they couldn't ignore the obvious hunger in their brother's family, and Arabi's family ate ravenously. The harvest of Arabi's field took a week, and with his two brothers feeding them, Ilshihagalu's milk returned. The new baby and the family would survive. With the field harvested, the brothers left, telling Arabi to focus his threshing and come back to pay them during the summer after the food situation had stabilized. The grain had to sit in bundles for a few days to dry out a bit, but working from the first harvested parts of the field, he began to bring bundles over to the house. This took two days, all the while Ilsha Higalu took the freshly harvested grain and began to hand thresh it, skipping over all the processing that most of the barley was about to undergo and just smacking the stalks against her hand to pull out parts of the grain seeds. This mess she took and crushed and made bread for the family. It was full of chaff, both unpalatable and prone to giving them digestional issues, but it was food, and it would tide the family over until the barley was processed. And as this episode is getting long, with no end in sight, we'll let that tide us over as well. What was going to be one episode looking at various aspects of the domestic economy has turned into a three-episode series following Arabi and his wife Ilsha Higalu. Fortunately, if the gods smile on them, the hard part has passed, and they're about to enter a year of hard work and well-earned prosperity. In the next episode, we'll follow Arabi as he processes the barley into bread and beer, the stuff of life. And in the episode after that, the family will sell some of their beer for wool that Ilsha Higalu can work into clothing for their new baby. But before we go, I do want to remind us all of a few things. Arabi is not a real person. This story is all a work of fiction. I want to use this to represent all the reading I've been doing on the topic of agriculture and domestic industry, but oftentimes when we build pictures of how things looked in the ancient world, we can develop a picture that's a bit neat and uniform. And so I've given A or B a bit of a hard time in this story to remind us that the work of the ancients could proceed through many different avenues. If you didn't have a copper sickle, you can have a clay or a flint one, or borrow your brothers, and so on. And it's easy, important to remember that A or B would not have been considered poor. Plenty of his neighbors are likely having a much easier time of things in this particular year, but he still has six iku of land in his name. He's not poor, he's just having a rough year, something all but the very richest could have expected to come about in their lifetimes. Still, even with all the hazards of baking, making a bunch of averages and statistics into one individual overly detailed narrative, I think the fictionalizing of daily life here is worth doing, both because I enjoy it and because it gets us into details that, are, that a more rigid recitation might miss. 
And so join us next time as we continue following the family of Aya Rabi through some ancient baking, ancient brewing, and maybe a bit of ancient cooking if we have time. Thank you for listening.